But um, so can you tell the story? And let me back up to how many Lifetime movies has this been made into? Is it at least two? There's only one movie. Um, there are lots of documentaries, lots of podcasts. I just did a podcast that dropped last Friday, um, a week ago from us talking right now with a guy in Australia. And Good. he read about my story in an article somewhere. I mean, I was thinking the other day, I literally, I know that that Billy Graham crusade, it still airs. So now it, I'm on the Billy Graham uh, classics. <laughs> so you're looking at a living classic. <laughs> All right. You're but that's okay. I'll take it. That's right. Take it. But, but I feel like because that still airs, because there are so many documentaries and so many programs that mm -hmm. people continue to be to know about my story, the part of my story that is most well known. And um, but there's so the movie aired in 1991 on CBS first mm -hmm. and it was called Nightmare in Columbia County. And then it was then moved over to Lifetime Television. And then from Lifetime Television, they changed the title and they it's now on Netflix. And the title is um, Victim of Beauty. Mm. So it's just the one movie. But it, it is amazing to me. I was just putting out my monthly newsletter yesterday. Mm -hmm. I thought. Good. And I thank you. And I have been so overwhelmed literally lately of just these people around the world. And one story in particular, there was a gentleman who wrote me from Germany on Instagram and he said, hello from Germany. I've just gotten your book. And he showed me a picture of my first book. Grace. So amazing. I had the original cover. I don't know where he got it, but he said all the way from the United States to Germany. And he began to talk about how that book God used in his life mm. to change his life. And I just, I sit in such awe and humility of that, like it just, I can't even believe what God's done. And I, mm -hmm. and I look back and I know that when I was a 21 year old college rising senior and tragedy struck my family at that point at 21, I could never imagine sitting here with you at 60 and saying, God has been so gracious. God has mm -hmm. done exactly what his word says that he will do cause all things to work together for good for those who love and him. And ashes to gold. Yeah. And yeah. and so it it really is a very uh, um overwhelming feeling. Well most people do know, but hopefully with this stream yard and it's gonna be blasted out and cut up by the way and on YouTube and I'll send you the links. Can you share that story with everyone? Sure. Um I was 21 and I was at Columbia College. I was a vocal performance major. Um, I'm the oldest of three children. I grew up in Lexington, South Carolina. If we want to get real, it was Red Bank in the middle of a field, 20 acres. And my daddy plopped our house in the middle of this field. And um, so my sister Sherry was 17, about to be 18. And she was about to graduate from high school. Mm -hmm. And my little brother was 15. And Sherry was two days from high school graduation and she had been practicing the national anthem at her high school. She was going to sing there and then she was going on a cruise with her classes, classmates. And then she was coming to Columbia College in the fall to study music as well. And the day of the graduation rehearsal, she had pulled her car into the driveway as she did every day. You know, we just have those things that we do every day, got out of the car because we lived in the country, our house was about 750 feet from the road, long dirt driveway lined with huge um, pine trees that we had planted, but they were tiny when we planted them. And she went to get the mail. And from what we understand happened, this man with a criminal record had seen her in town, thought she was beautiful and she was, and he claimed to have pulled a gun and he told her to get in the car. And she got in the car and he took her from us. And back then, back in, it was May 31st. So we're coming up on the 39th anniversary, which is hard mm -hmm. to believe because in my mind, Sherry is always 17. Mm -hmm. um, and so he, uh, that was back when there were no cell phones. I mean, you know, now we can see each other and we can text and we can FaceTime and all these things that we 
had none of that. We just had house phones back then. And so she literally disappeared. Mm. And, and it was five days that we did not know where she was. Mm. And um, this unknown man began to call her home. And he asked to speak to my mom. And so she was talking to this person and she thought that it was an authority because he was talking about what Sherry had on. She was at the mailbox. Her car was left running. Her purse was inside on the passenger seat. And then all of a sudden my mom hung up the phone. And I remember she said, oh, my God, that man has Sherry. Mm. And that's when we realized that she had probably been kidnapped. Mm. And um, so he called eight different times during that month long investigation. We were literally prisoners in our own home. We did not leave the house. We could not leave the house. And it became very upsetting to my mother to talk to this person who had her daughter. I mean, you and I are mothers. I, I mean, I can't imagine. I love my children and you love your children so mm. much that when I put myself in my mother's shoes, I just I was a sister. But she was the mother and, and as mothers, our children are a part of us. And and we my mom said her heart literally physically ached uh, when Sherry was taken. And I can I can mm -hmm. get that as a mother. And yeah. and so I, at 21 years old, I remember this um, really lovely FBI agent lady asking me to go upstairs into my bedroom and she said, we're going to need to ask you to do something. We need for you to answer the phone. It's too upsetting for your mom. Mm. And, and that was back when FBI profiling was a brand new science. And so they had put together this profile of this man that if I could be kind and patient and understanding and keep him on the phone as long as possible, uh, they would trace the call and they would hopefully get Sherry back. And I remember all these years later, I remember being asked that question. I didn't even hesitate. I said, yes, I'll do it. I'll do whatever I can do. Because it was a very helpless feeling, Jane. I mean, we were just stuck at home waiting. And I thought, well, at least this is something I can actively do to mm -hmm. help to try to get my sister back. And so that's that's how it began. And, and it's such a long story. Um, but he ended up um, killing my sister and calling her home and... Um, giving me directions to her body. Mm. Um, but before he killed her, he allowed her to write the most amazing letter. And her, if people have seen the um, FBI profiler, um, the, this episode is called um, Last Will. FBI profile, I think is what it's on. Mm. And it's about Sherry's letter and how her letter was such a gift to my family because in that letter, at 17 years old, she is sitting in this room with this man who has told her he's going to take her life. Mm. And she's looking at that blank piece of paper. And often when I share her letter, I often think, how in the world would I face that blank piece of paper, even at this mm. age, knowing those would be the last words I would ever speak to my children, to my family, to my loved ones. Mm -hmm. And she just, there was no fear in her letter there was so much faith and at 17 years old, she told my family not to let her death ruin our lives to keep living one day at a time for Jesus. Mm -hmm. She said some good will come out of this. And then she quoted that Romans eight twenty eight that I shared earlier. And I look back and I am so overwhelmed with how God and only God can take such tragedy mm -hmm. and turn it into such a beautiful, um, tool and story for his glory alone. You know, it is, it is, it is a story I have been called upon to share thousands and thousands of times. And it's gotten so much easier over the years. But I remember when I was first crowned Miss South Carolina and my very first appearance was at Flat Rock Baptist Church in Liberty, South Carolina. And I was, I had been Miss Liberty and then I was Miss South Carolina and they asked me to come tell my story and sing Amazing Grace. And Jane, I remember just sobbing at that, sobbing mm -hmm. in that pulpit, just could not tell the story without crying. But, you know, the Lord is so gracious and he brings healing and he brings hope and he brings purpose in the pain. And, and, and then all of a sudden I can, I can talk about it because right. the Lord's brought peace and forgiveness and healing 
And it really is a privilege. I just thank you for having me on your podcast because oh, goodness. it is, you know, when somebody asks me, who are you? And I really am. And I love all your books. I love your Southern humor and I'm a Southern girl right with you. But, you know, I say, I'm just a simple Southern woman. I love Jesus. And I love to share the message of hope that he's written into my life. And I really do. And so I just thank you for inviting me to come be on here and share it because my prayer is always that God would use this story of this simple girl from South Carolina to just speak hope into the lives of other people who might be feeling hopeless, who might be in circumstances that are beyond comprehension that they'll ever be okay again. I just had a friend call me night before last and this friend just said, what I'm going through is so painful. I don't know if I'm ever going to be okay. And I said, excuse me, do you not know me? Yeah. I'm okay. Mm -hmm. God says you're going to be okay. Yeah. But it is painful and it is a process. And that's what people seem to forget. 1985 was 39 years ago and I wasn't okay in 1985. But mm -hmm. the next year, God allowed me the platform of being Miss South Carolina. And mm -hmm. he began to allow me to see the purpose that he could bring about even mm. this deep dark tragedy.